Hello and welcome to the very last episode of Series 2 of Chatterbox. My name is Callum and I'm an associate artist at Playbox Theatre, the company behind Chatterbox. And what a great couple of months we've had, right? I don't know about you all, but I have loved chatting to some incredible artists, actors and writers. But we felt that as buildings were starting to open up again, it was time for us to wind up our weekly Chatterbox sessions. So this will be the very last one. Just let me remind you of some of the guests we've had on the show since we began back in April. We've had the BAFTA, Emmy and Olivier nominated actor Juliet Stevenson, multi award winning Hamlet, Parpa Essiedu, uh, Jonathan Case and Jamie Ballard from Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, star of the English game, Neve Walsh, Broadway up and comer, Nasia Thomas, RSC sensation, Lucy Phelps, Dave Hearn, Charlie Russell from The Goes Wrong Show, Kevin McNally, Phyllis Logan, George Mackay, Shoppe Dirisu, Amy Lou Wood. And we've got an incredible guest to add to that list this week. But just remember, next week when you're having Chatterbox withdrawals, there is a huge back catalogue for you to jump into. And they're all available at playboxtheatre.com forward slash chatterbox. Now, before I introduce today's guest, and you know the drill by now, chatterboxers, we want you to get involved in these conversations too. So if you're one of the lucky young people with me now in the Zoom interview, get your questions coming in. All you need to do is hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen on a laptop or the top of your screen on a mobile, and you'll find a button you can click to send questions directly to me. Importantly, you'll be able to see the questions other people have asked and vote for the ones you would like to hear answered. The more votes, the higher they appear in my inbox. And as always, we will try and get through as many as we can. Now, if you're watching live on Facebook, hello. Now you can't message in questions, but we do still want to hear from you. So send us your reactions, comments, and feedback to at Playbox Theatre, hashtag Chatterbox on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, we don't mind which. Now, it is time to introduce my special guest. Kai graduated from the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in 2011. She's one of BAFTA's Elevate members and was selected as a rising star by the Evening Standard in 2017. Her film credits include Maleficent, Ready Player One, The Bad Education Movie. She was seen in both series of Fleabag, she's in Game of Thrones, the Fox thriller Deep State. And she's taken leading roles at the National Theatre, Royal Court and Hampstead Theatre. She's just finished shooting the action feature film Infinite, alongside Mark Wahlberg, Chiwetel Ejiofor and Rupert Friend, which is slated for release in 2021. But let's check out a scene from another of Kai's fantastic credits. Strangers on ITV and Amazon. Let's take a look at a highlight. Ruin my morning. Hey. It's amazing. It's cool. Cool? But what am I going to do with it? Barely allowed to leave the house, let alone join another rally. Maybe it's time to take this flag and go be daring. I need your help. It's the size of a parachute. Then parachute, dare you. I'll do it if you do it with me. Come on. This is how we protest without getting caught. Please. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> OK. Yeah? If it's big, mm -hmm. like an advertising board, mm -hmm. let's advertise. Yeah. Another drink? Uh, yeah. Then we break some laws. Welcome our last Chatterbox guest to series two, the remarkably talented Kai Alexander. 
Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Hi. Hello. Thank you. Thanks How for you? having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. How are you holding up? Yeah, very good, very good. Excellent. Staying calm. <laughs> That's all we can do. That's all we can do. <laughs> now, our first question comes from last week's guest, mm. star of the video game Assassin's Creed, Abu Bakr Salim. He mm. wants to know, Mm -hmm. What is the difference between acting for screen and acting for stage? Now, it's a question that has come up a lot on Chatterbox. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered if it meant anything different for you in terms of preparation. Is there a diff Do you prepare differently for your first day on set versus your first day in rehearsals? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So um, I've really had to learn how to prepare for screen. Um, when I started to get work after drama school, because we didn't really learn much about the technical side of preparation for screen, because um, as many would know, it it's filming in, you know, it doesn't, it's not filming in the order that it would be telling. So you have to almost create kind of like a, a timesheet for yourself. So you have to work out which scenes you're in. And then from that, you have to work out what order you'd be doing all your scenes in and, yeah, there's a lot of filing and there's a lot of admin and a lot of kind of like um, working out your character journey. And because sometimes, you know, you might be doing your last scene in, on your first week, etc. And then just to kind of like give yourself a heads up to um, in terms of preparation, because so you it's it's kind of exciting in the way that um, it's very different to uh, doing a play because you get to find out the whole journey with your with the whole company and the director and I really enjoy that um, that challenge and that collaboration but I also really enjoy preparing for screen in a way that um, I feel like I'm almost doing like mini short films every day oh. um, and yeah it's just the way you approach it the approach is very very different and I find it it's it's a bit different and it's a bit it's quite exciting almost. The the, the preparation for film is much more um, isolated. It's done on your own and then you turn up yes. and for something. Hmm. So there's a lot of kind of like desk work, you know. So if you like um, organizing, gosh, yeah, it's, it's for you. <laughs> and we were we were talking yesterday, Kai, about one of the big differences being um, the d departments that you have on a film set. Hmm. Do you think that's partly what separates the world? That there's, you know, there's so many different groups working on a film set to, to bring the film together, much more than there are in theatre. Yeah, so on set, you're, it's very obvious that you are one part of many departments. And obviously, what we, what we all do is very important. You have to really respect that... Um, that your time is allocated for an actor and it's not just about actors. And so, yeah, that's why the preparation at home in wherever you're staying um, is very, very vital. The, the work that you do um, before you get on set, because when you're on set, you really have to respect whatever, what everyone else is doing in terms of setting, lighting, design, props, costume, makeup, that, yeah, you, you almost have to be so aware of that time and to kind of like respect everyone else, which is quite a, a different process to, um, to rehearsing for a play where it just feels a little bit more like who you see is basically, you know, is part of the, the play. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, and I don't know, I get, I love being on set or I love being um, part of a big production because I get to find out there are just so many incredible departments that I wish I'd knew. So um, I don't know if many of you guys went to the Harry Potter studios. Ah, oh, okay. When they first opened, one of the biggest things that, um, that really drew um, attention to me was the special effects and all the prosthetics and how they created all the creatures and, and even green screen. I didn't know anything about green screen and there's this whole oh. bit where you can like, get on a, a broom and then they'll, they'll make a video and then they'll add the, the, the oh, wow, okay. yeah, you get the whole experience. And I remember thinking, God, I really hope I get to do this kind of thing one day. Um, well, I guess you do, you sort of did, did you on, on Game of Thrones? Game of Thrones and Maleficent, there was a lot of flying and CGI and 
yeah, I, I, yeah, I was very lucky to experience all that. So, well, I was going to ask about um, Leaf in in Game of Thrones because that's, I mean, it's quite a tran- must have been quite a transformation to to, to if anyone who's yeah. not seen it. Um, you're sort of completely head to toe, sort of brownie grey with this kind of woody texture over you, um, vines and almost kind of a solid looking hair piece as well. I was, I, I saw it and thought, Josh, how long must you have spent in the makeup chair? Yeah. Um, do you know what? I had no heads up over what I was getting myself into because I just auditioned like any other part and they were like oh you got it please don't tell anyone and there was this hush hush thing which I'd never experienced as well and then so when I went into fitting I basically ended up yeah being painted on for the whole day there were like months of prep to work out how long it would take to to do the full body prosthetics and I mean, what they do is incredible, but um, I was not prepared for, initially, the very first time we tried it, it took about 14 hours. And then they really had to cut it down because otherwise I wouldn't be able to film as much in the day. (laughs) And yeah, the filming hours were very, very antisocial, but um, I mean, it was really worth it. But it's, it's, um, yeah, I wish, I wish I'd known how to prepare for that because, you have to stay so calm and you have to be so mm-hmm. patient and you have to make sure that you sleep because you probably have a very short turn over until you go again. Um, but yeah. It was... Do you find all that, all the prosthetics, do you find that sort of claustrophobic to be yeah. in? Yeah. You almost, you have to stay really, really calm. Otherwise you start to freak out. It's, that feeling was always there. <laughs> <laughs> so, it wasn't, do, so did it help you with your, performance then or was it something you were having to kind of work uh you had to deal with en route to to your no I think it definitely did it was something I felt I I mean you can't take it off so you are so they as soon as you go on no one has ever seen what you look like most of the people on on set anyway the Mm. crew members so you feel different um yeah, I was, it's like I was in character involuntarily because it was literally glued on me. On you. <laughs> <laughs> you were stuck into your character. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, yeah but it was really fun. I thought it was you, very interesting. You mentioned the hush-hush thing there too. I've always wondered what it's like stepping into... Um, what, it's kind of like a juggernaut of a show, isn't it? It's popular all over the world and the fans are so dedicated to it. I, you know, is there a kind of pressure associated with that of of stepping into something that's already so popular yeah very good question um well at the time i was living on a narrow boat so i didn't really i wasn't very connected like i didn't have um (laughs) i didn't have tv or anything and i had very minimal contact because we weren't connected to um yeah um or maybe i just wasn't as connected to social media and i knew that it was a big show but i was quite late in the game and um i mean and he definitely escalated after season five and like yeah whenever um (laughs) we filmed it but um i don't know the hush hush the the secretness was really difficult because i literally I, i wasn't sure i was so scared what would happen if my friends knew so like i really tried my best to not tell anyone apart from my boyfriend and yeah, I would just disappear for months. And then <laughs> I had to pretend that I was, I don't know. I don't know. It was so obvious. But uh, yeah, it's not, I don't know. I think I approach things quite naively most of the time. So I don't really put that kind of pressure because it's not my pressure. Mm. I just need to do, you know, leave. So, yeah. um, and it feels like an entire different thing that you have no control over. So Um, And is that the same when you work with sort of big stars as well? Because, you know, you've done, you've worked with Mark Wahlberg most recently, Angelina Jolie, you know, uh, do you feel, do you approach that in the same way, stepping onto set with a big star? Are you able to kind of keep a a calmness or naivety, as you said about that? Sometimes, sometimes. But then like, I'm also very aware that I get imposter syndrome wherever I go. 
<laughs> so, so if they're big stars or they're not no stars or maybe I'm just intimidated because I'm just having that kind of day so I just I do realize that it's not really them it's just me and yeah it's it's a bit it's weird isn't it it's a weird industry um sometimes but you know you have to have a good sense of humor yeah a sense of humor helps <laughs> And that, that your most recent one, Infinite, um, mm -hmm. and this is probably maybe going to be an impossible question, but I'm going to ask anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at where that shot, and I don't know if you went to all of these places, but it was London, Mexico, Nepal, New York, Thailand. I, I wondered if you thought whether our new companion in life, COVID-19, is going to put a stop to big international projects like that. Wow. Um... I hope not, <laughs> because I think the travel is definitely the big perks of what we do. Um, um, yeah, I've, I mean, I hope not, because I've, I've made so many great friends working um, internationally, um, especially the crew. You get so close and you become so, you become like a family and it's just a wonderful way to understand a culture. Mm -hmm. um, even when we did Strangers, there were half British crew and half Hong Kong crew. And yeah, towards the end, we were like crying. And, you know, it's very special. It's a bit like NYT sort of like, it's a bit like a summer, it has that kind of summer camp um, energy because yeah, the chance that you probably won't be able to work together again. And you really kind of enjoy this moment. And that's probably why we all kind of get into this industry to sort of, that kind of the intense moment you know of it yeah. um i don't know but i hope not <laughs> i hope not as well <laughs> um no we, it's not just sort of big high budget studio productions that you've done you've also you also make your own work um i, I know you've done some stand-up in the past um i, I well, I, I, I saw a clip on YouTube today. Um, we riffing on the fact that we, to quote you, talk Asian to Google, and that really that really tickled me. Oh. Um, uh, but I think during lockdown, you've made a short film as well, a one-person film called mm. Handstands. Mm -hmm. um, is is creating your own work something that um, is important to you? Yes, I think so. I think if you have a real burning desire to tell a. Uh, a um, yeah, if it's if something's really niggling at you, where you think, oh, I really, maybe someone could do with me sharing this story, it's probably something worth exploring. You know, it's it doesn't have to be in a film sense. It could be a poem, or it could be a, a book, or I don't know, an essay. But um, yeah, I think it's taken me a while to trust that instinct, trust that kind of that um that voice mm. um because i think for a long time i didn't think that it was it was valid right because especially um from my perspective and the lack of representation our um we haven't been validated in um in the past as much it's getting better so it's it's confusing you're going oh, okay no one's telling stories about us but then like this, there are no stories. So maybe they're not interested. And then you start to, um, yeah, you just start to kind of give up and the voice gets smaller. But I think um, the voice should always be loud and you should always try to tell. I think everyone has a story to tell, so. What well, handstands, um, and for, again, anybody who's not seen it, it's uh, 90, about 90 seconds long, is that right? And it's people can watch it for free on your Instagram. So maybe after this, go and watch it. And the strap line is, um, a girl struggles to do a handstand while racism pushes her off balance until she falls into an abyss of self-hatred and shame. And I, I loved it. I really genuinely loved it. Oh, thank you. Um, and I mean, j jump in and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think it sort of was sounds like, it, um, it chimed to me in terms of what you're saying there that it was about maybe trying to or wanting to conform uh, the mm. handstand being a kind of really in vogue thing to do in the gym mm. at the moment isn't it mm -hmm. um, and not being able to do that handstand or fit into that current trend seemed to link to the 
um, the things you were talking about in terms of being different at school, which you expressed through the dialogue as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's been written by, directed by Stars You. It felt a really clear act of self-expression, I think, mm -hmm. which is, I guess, what you're talking about. I wondered um, what, if anything, are you hoping people will take away from Handstands? Oh, the film? Mm. Um, so that was an isolation project in, in our garden. Um, I don't know, it came from a poem that I was just writing um, and just bit, a, a bit of it. Um, yeah, that was a very good um, experiment for me to go, oh yeah, my feelings are valid. Like my, these niggly feelings are something to be shared because maybe someone else feels it. Um, yeah, I think validating each other's experience is quite important at this kind of like real isolating times, so. And do you feel more vulnerable about doing that um, as your, uh, I guess, profile increases? You know, I'm thinking you've got sort of 12,000 followers on Instagram. Does that make it um, an easier or a, or a more difficult platform to, to share in, do you think? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm not very good. I wish I was more um, carefree. I, w I wish I, I, wish I um, had more confidence in my, on my social media platforms, but um, working on it. Um, I think so. I think we all have a lot to share and I think it's okay. I think expression, it's, it's okay as long as you're approaching it through kindness and through, um, generosity you know as long as we are we're trying to um you're clear with what sort of message you want to say um i think it could be a very useful platform to be to be inspired to inspire and to be inspired by i mean i follow some incredible people i've learned so much on platforms like instagram because of it you know you can really find people that resonate with you and that are doing things like this and mm -hmm. Um, yeah, a, a profile, a, like a, an Instagram page can really make your life sometimes. I've been, yeah, I've found some incredible people in there. So yeah, I totally and, think. And I guess it's also been a creative outlet for you as well through mm -hmm. showcasing that short film. Yeah. Um, now look, let's rewind to the very start of your career. Yeah. So uh, you trained at Guildhall. Mm -hmm. Was that an inevitability for you? Did you always know that you were going to be an actor? Um, did I always know? No. No. <laughs> no so what, think, what was the path that took you there? I think I just really, really couldn't, I was too active. I was too hyper at school. Um, but I didn't have anything. I didn't have anything that kept me focused, that kept me, um, I just, I found school so boring and I really struggled attending school as well because I just found it really really boring and um and my friend at the time um invited me to come with her to the Brit school open day and I had nothing else to do so I, I went along and I've never seen a bunch of kids my age who looked so happy you know who were so so just free and happy and they were actually we weren't just expressing that kind of energy like on the playground. It was through work, through like pieces. And it blew my mind. I didn't realize that you could channel in that way. Um, yeah, because we were 14 at the time, I think. And I didn't quite understand what it was, but then I knew that I wanted to be in that environment. Mm. And I think sometimes that's enough. And you just kind of take it one step at a time. And yeah, it took me a while. I took a movement director from Guildhall when I was doing a show at NYT to tell me about Guildhall. So I didn't know the school. Oh, ah, okay. Um, I thought it was a music school, so. It's funny that um, seeing those people being happy and wanting to be a part of that group, that's definitely something I have experienced going to drama school, walking into a room and going, ah, oh, um, these are my people. I'm, I found yeah. my people. Yeah. Um, and it's a really, uh, it's a really powerful feeling, isn't it? I think um, so. to just be able to remember the time when we didn't have that, mm. it's huge, I think. Just to be, go, oh, okay, it's okay to care here, you yeah. know? 
Yeah. Um, and one of our previous guests on Chatterbox, um, Papa Esiedu, spoke about his time at Guildhall recently and said oh. that he felt Guildhall's idea of an actor was a sort of Damien Lewis or an Eddie Redmayne and that the curriculum was geared towards that. Mm. I wondered how well you felt served by Guildhall in terms of the plays and projects you were cast in. Yeah, it was hugely problematic and I think it wasn't as, I didn't see it at the time because I guess I sort of, yeah, I wasn't emotionally um, intelligent enough to realise my worth then. So mm -hmm. I thought that, <laughs> it's so sad really because, yeah, I just thought that, oh, I was just a token and that's, I should be happy or something. It was very, I was very, very, um, I was so grateful that I didn't really question it, but there were so many, um, I mean, never mind um, the racial inclusion in terms of um, stories, um, there were just so little parts for women. So we did, we would do the Greeks, right? And um, as an exercise, we did Oedipus and, um, is it Yakosta, the mother? Yeah. Um, and so the women would play her and then the, all the men would play Oedipus, but we all had to split the lines, right? Yeah. Yakosta has no lines. And we had to split that between seven women. And he knows it was that like kind of exercise where we had to just, just kind of go in. And, and then so obviously that created that kind of competition when you're competing with five other women and there's only mm -hmm. 10 lines in the film. And then the guys are just like, they're struggling, there's too many lines, you know? Yeah. And that was, that in itself is a problem that we never address, never mind. So yeah, there was just a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what do you think can be, what should be done? What more can we do in drama, at drama schools to, to um, correct that imbalance? I think opening that dialogue, which I feel like they're doing now and kind of listening and updating, um, which I feel is happening. And it's, you know, the current students and yeah, the past couple of years, they've been so brave at speaking up and reaching out for like dreaming for a better training. And it's so commendable and I have so much respect. Um, yeah. Well, look, that leads quite nicely onto our questions from the young people watching. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to kick off by bringing someone up on screen to ask a question camera to camera to you. Rich is going to magic Phoebe onto your screen. Uh, now, Phoebe is a member of Playbox, the youth theatre that produced Chatterbox. Mm -hmm. And Phoebe has turned up to loads of these Chatterbox sessions. She's a really dedicated member. Um, Phoebe. Ah, oh, there you are, Phoebe. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm not too bad, thank you. Thanks for asking. Um, I think you've got a question for Kai, haven't you? Yes, I do. So my question is, do you have any advice for aspiring actors who are leaving school on what they can do to get ahead in the business? And also, what were your first steps after leaving drama school? Um, thank you for your question. Um, my advice is to uh don't do it alone so make sure you have your friends um speak about you know make sure that you create like a supportive network of friends and keep supporting each other don't get competitive don't get intimidated by what they're doing it's a different journey um everyone has a very different journey and it's really hard to um remember that when you first leave drama school i just i remember and um but remember why you're doing it i think it's sometimes you know we get so carried away with the competition and the kind of the uncertainty that we always forget why you're doing it and maybe if it if you're if it's really getting you down then create your own work always remember that we're artists as well as you know just actors um yeah and um I think in terms of working as a freelancer, I think at drama school, I wish they taught us a little bit more about um, hustling a little bit in terms of surviving, paying for rent, all that kind of thing is very overwhelming when you first leave drama school. 
And yeah, I remember struggling to prepare for an audition because I had to work to start paying off the student debt that I've accumulated. And that was, um, yeah, so just having more chats about how you can survive when you're starting out. Um, Mm, that sort of stuff to look into is very important just to kind of like make sure that you're balanced you know so that you can keep um so it doesn't feel so much like a punishment um yeah <laughs> that's great does that answer your question phoebe yeah that's great thank you thank thanks you thanks for coming on phoebe see you soon yeah, to see you. Bye. 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 now look before we head over to the q a earlier on today on instagram we did a takeover of Playbox's Instagram account and we gave everyone the chance to pitch a question for you to answer. Um, and we, we held a vote. Mm -hmm. And with 60% of the vote, the question people want to know the answer to is what has been your favorite project to work on? What would be my favorite project to work on? Um, gosh, I would love to do a play right now. Mm -hmm. I would love to do something classical. Um, I would love to um, explore Chekhov, um, but I would also like to do like an independent film, a small scale film. And what about from your back catalogue uh, that you've you've uh, so far? Oh, you said. <laughs> well, no, but but <laughs> that equally as valid. Oh, from my back, as in like, what is my favourite? Yeah. Oh, okay. Have you had one? Mm, I think it's... Oh, I really like doing Gloria at Hampstead. Ah, okay. Really it's a lovely theatre. Really lovely theatre. And the play was written by Brandon Jacob Jenkins, who wrote Octoroon. And he, it, yeah, it's, it was probably one of the most... I think I really started to own my, um, my space in the industry when I started doing Gloria. Oh, great. That's a great answer. Um, so let's take it over to some of these questions in my inbox here. Um, right at the top, lots of votes. This is from Rebecca. Um, Rebecca wants to know, what did you, what did you learn from Guildhall? Uh, and what has most influenced you as a performer? What did I learn from Guildhall? Okay, so this might sound a little bit cheesy, but um, I learned how to breathe at Guildhall. Um, yeah, the more I think about it, um, yeah, we, at, um, we had a teacher called Patsy Rodenberg and she used to teach us every morning and every morning for about 30 minutes, we would have to get our breath down. Um, yeah. And I didn't realize that my breath was up or what, and yeah. And I continuously am very, very aware of that when I'm, especially when I'm doing stage, but yeah, just all the time, just go, okay, why am I panicking? Um, breathe. and you can, you, you can feel that change in mood in your breath. Yeah, I think so. I think, well, I didn't know any of this kind of stuff before Guildhall. Um, and then this sort of prep, yeah, prep, um, is huge. I think like right. knowing the right state to be in, right. is huge, which I, yeah. Le um, what was the second question? And the second half of that um, yeah. was um, uh, things that have influenced you as a performer, perhaps other performers who have influenced you. Lots of people influence me. Uh, gosh. Um, I worked with a lovely, brilliant actor called Ken Collard. He was brilliant in um, a sitcom called We the Jury. I, I really loved working with uh, Victoria Hamilton in Deep State. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, she was incredible. So incredible to work with. Um, I don't know, Nicola Walker. Yeah, I really liked working with SJ Clarkson who directed Collateral. Um, she's an incredible incredible director and I've never yeah I, yeah she really gave me a real insight into the possibilities and yeah I learned a lot from watching her. What was it about her work that um, stood out for you that you enjoyed being a part of? Okay so this is this was fascinating so when I went on set early one time because we we're filming in a house in a location house and I walked 
in and I saw SJ and her DP, they would rehearse the scene in advance. They would act out the scene. So oh, she, wow. so if it's a two-hander, they would actually act the scene and find all the possible places that they could do. And I didn't realize that they do, some directors do that. And wow. or like that kind of real intimate um, collaboration with a DP in that way, even before the actors came on blew my mind. I was like, that's, that's creative. That is art. You know, that's when people, I love working people who love what they do. That is it. So it's a lot of people. Um, mm. Yeah. It's, yeah. I love, I just love being in, a, in company with people who are just obsessed and passionate. That's great. It's always the best, <laughs> the best rooms to be in, right? Right. <laughs> Um, this, here's one from uh, Eileen. Eileen wants to know, she says, film sets can be very busy and chaotic. Mm. How do you stop yourself from being distracted whilst you're trying to be in character? That's a very good question. So yeah, once again, doing a bit of check, check in with yourself, do the breathing thing, make sure. So on, on, the, on the size, the smaller versions of the, the scripts that you get on the day, maybe have a little note, just as a reference, make sure you have references. I think a lot of very good, very, um, I've seen a couple of actors now who have little notebooks sometimes as a reference point of where they are in the character um, and what the character's objective is in this scene. And I mean, it's okay to have fun, um, but if you think it's too distracting, then you have to know what you need to do to be ready. Um, yeah, but definitely don't worry about fit, you know being liked or being the fun one or yeah, it's not a party, it's work and everyone understands. So yeah, respect yourself. <laughs> That's good. That's great advice. Respect yourself. Hmm. Um, here's a question from Bavan. Bavan asks, um, do you think that the Black Lives Matter campaign will help other uh, minority ethnic groups? And if so, how? Well, I hope so. I think it's really highlighted um, the people who are in positions of power and the lack of diversity within that. So it's more, um, yeah, what's going on behind. Um, and I feel like that's a conversation that's been had now. So, yeah, let's see. I think um, just better diverse storytelling would benefit all of us. Um, yeah, I think it's about time we tell. Different. There's a lot to be told, yeah. Yeah. Been told, yeah. No more Oscar Wilde's. <laughs> um, so this is from uh, Caitlin, who says, uh, I saw that you were recently announced to be joining the audio cast for a Torchwood drama. Oh, yes. She says she's a big fan of that universe, and mm -hmm. she's curious to know how you feel about working with Big Finish. Oh yes, so this is my second time working with Big Finish and I love it. It's super fun. I've, I, have, I hardly do any, um, I rarely do much audio. So it's um, audio recording or audio plays, would you call them? Um, yeah, so it's really, really fun. And this is quite secretive as well, isn't it? So it's a bit hush hush, right? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but it's super fun and the people are lovely and I met a very good mate um, from that job, Jeremy Lee Jones, and yeah, it's good. Excellent. Um, Isabella asks, mm. um, where is it? Oh, there we go. Um, how do you think working for Disney uh, early in your career has helped you become the actress you are today? You mean Maleficent? I think so. Well, that was only a couple of years ago, but um, mm, I'm not sure. Um, but I really enjoyed the family. It was very family friendly on set. Everyone brought their family, their children in. And yeah, and there was a lot of children in the film and there was always an ice cream van. And <laughs> yeah, it was that sort of thing. Um, but no, I, I don't really, I don't really know. In terms, was it different in terms of um, mm -hmm. the, the scale of that production must have been huge? So big, yes. There was a day where um, there was about 500 of us in scorching heat in this makeup. And 
I've never seen anything like it. And there were horses and various animals and special effects people with their green screen puppets. And yeah, there was a lot going on and just, but the thing is, it's really hard when you're on set with that many people because you can't just break. Mm. Uh, you can't just go to the toilet because then everyone goes to the toilet, then it's like an hour break or something. Um, so yeah, that was very interesting. But it's, um, it's incredible what they can do with that budget. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, I mean what an inc- it was such a beautiful film, mm. wasn't it? Mm. Um, sort of linked to that, um, Isabella here asks, what did you think, uh, how did you, what did you think when you went to the first script reading with Angelina Jolie? Was she there at the script reading? Um, so I don't think I did the script reading, but I did a lot of stunt training. And I did, um, yeah, I, I hadn't met her until we met on set. Um, but I remember just doing lots and lots of stunt stuff and um, lots of standing behind green screen <laughs> <laughs> with her. And then there was a lot of kind of like, flying sequences that they'll kind of add. So we we would do them individually. So we did a lot of like flying looks and there was a lot of acting with the uh, acting to crosses. There was a lot of CGI basically. Oh really? Oh, okay. Yeah, but which was really fun. And then we did um, a lot of, um, I did an ADR session for a film like that. I didn't realize that you start doing, I got to see, like the mid um, stages of CGI when I did the ADI and that was pretty cool. What is that, um, what is the mid stage? What does that look like? It sort of looks like hand drawn, it's a mixture of hand drawn and it's a mixture of the green screen stuff. Like you can see a little bit of how they do it. And that was exciting. And yeah, yeah. the bits that they cut up and then the bits that they're, they're keeping and the bits that they've just kept just for reference and stuff, yeah. Um, but yes, it was lovely to work with Angelina and Jolie. Uh, fantastic. Um, well, Eliza wants to know what it was like to work with Phoebe Wallabridge. Oh, Phoebe's great. So I worked with Phoebe um, on Bad Education. Um, she was a guest star in one of the episodes and she played the most hilarious teacher. Um, yeah, and she was great. And it was really, really nice to see yeah, see her kind of, her play, her one woman show, just kind of see the stages of that. And mm. it's, yeah, I just, I was just so happy to be kind of like a little part of that to kind of support. It's, that sort of energy is really, really nice, isn't it? When you're just like, oh my God, this is, I'm so happy for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just so happy for you, you're so great. Yeah. <laughs> did you see, did you see the one woman show? Did I see it? Did did I see it? Did I see it? I had seen it recently again, but I don't know if I saw it. I don't know. I feel like I had at Soho. I don't know, but I remember I knew a lot about it. I don't know now, but I had seen it recently at the West End. It was really good. So good. It's great. And it's amazing how uh, how well Mm. he had able to transfer Mm -hmm. that feeling onto screen. Because that's a really difficult thing to do when you've got, you know, it was, the stage show was so, um, so much a stage show, wasn't it? And so to then expand that into a, into a piece of television, I thought was so skillfully done. So did you see it before the show came out? I had read it before the show came oh, out. Okay. Cool, yeah, cool. yeah so that was confusing because... I think it almost erased my first experience, maybe, because I'd seen it post the shows. I and see. The, oh, okay, the right. You know what you're talking about so visually. Yeah. So it was such a, yeah, incredible experience for everyone to kind of like know the show, love the show, and then to watch the stage show. Yeah. Um, Caitlin here mm-hmm. says, is there a difference in your approach? Oh, this is interesting. Is there a difference in your approach to acting between film and television? Does the difference in production style, directors, does that impact you as an actor? It doesn't impact me, but I think different productions need different things. 
So you have to almost, um, you have to, you have to sort of listen. And I think when you go into fittings for screen, etc., you can really kind of ask lots of questions to the showrunner. There's a lot of that um, because the script can change. Whereas I think the play pretty much, you would know if the play is changing, but it probably doesn't change as much as what I've seen on script, um, on film, um, more so. Uh, yeah, I think over the years, I think I've just got better at asking questions and kind of, yeah, I think at the beginning, I thought that I had to know everything, but then it became very apparent that actors really don't know anything. So like, <laughs> we, we get cast, you know, we get invited in last, so we really don't know anything. So we really need to ask these questions. And it's okay to ask these questions because we care about what we do. Mm. Whereas at the beginning, I remember thinking, oh God, if people knew that I didn't know about this and this and this, then, you know. Um, so yeah, don't be, a, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, and in terms of, um, like different approach. Sometimes you have to be more physically um, prepared. So I remember, um, yeah, some jobs I had to do more training in and other stuff I had to do more research. Um, that, yeah. You mentioned that all the stunt work on Ma Maleficent. Mm -hmm. Was that something that, um, was that an enjoyable process for you or is that something that uh, you sort of were reluctantly having to go through? No, I love it. I love it. I think it's so fun to be like on, on Maleficent. I got flung. I was on a harness and I, I flew up in the air outside. It wasn't studio. And I remember there was one shot after three months of practicing this thing where, you know, the rope gets cut off and then I fly back up to the sky and we actually did the filming. Or maybe we were training outside or something. One morning I got flown up. You get yanked up. And then I met a bird on the sky. <laughs> no. I was like, well, this is definitely worth it. Whatever it is that I'm doing, it's, it seems really crazy and dangerous. But yeah, I completely empathize with people who, did, who are not such an adrenaline junkie as I am. But um, it's really fun. And some people are great. And you get to be really fit. And you get trained. Um, yeah, on a job. So I'm very grateful for that. Do you, I didn't see the show. Did you do lots of flying on um, uh, Wendy and Peter Pan? Yes. So that was the beginning of that. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. And that was counterweight. Have you ever experienced that? No. Where they, you have another actor or an, a, an actor. It was sort of like we all had to train to be counterweight. So we had another actor going up and down the, the, this ladder. Oh, wow. You could see it live, how it works. Um, yeah. It was really interesting. It was really. So were you fun. having to sort of throw your weight down to send somebody else up? Yeah. So they will have to kind of climb back up and climb back up down, and yeah, they have to clip us and clip us off, and yeah. Gosh, it's mad what the things that we do. <laughs> yeah, the things you're asked to do as an actor often. Yeah. It's really uh, fun. Wild. <laughs> wild, wild, and kind of potentially dangerous, but we love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm on from Fiona. What would you be doing if you weren't an actor? What would I be doing? I'm not sure. I think I'll probably be making stuff. I'll probably be, I'll make sure stories are told. I think I, I would hope that I'm still, I, I would still be part of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Nice. Another one here from Caitlin. Um, she wants to know how you think actors can support each other in the industry. Hmm. I think that's a good question because sometimes it can feel a little bit competitive, particularly when you're at drama school or just coming out of drama school. Yeah, um, it's a really good question and I've definitely struggled and it, it takes time. It takes time to realise that, oh, I need, I need my community um, because you sort of, you start hiding when you're struggling, right? You start to kind of, yeah, you start to go, I don't want to burden you. But um, I don't know. I think it's just being honest, isn't it? Being honest that we're struggling. It's, it's really, really difficult. It's, we're in a really uncertain time now. But, you know, actors kind of feel like that all the time. Um, and it's okay because we all feel like this. And 
Yeah, and I think it's kind of, it's sort of practicing having better conversations, more trusting conversations, and less about what we're doing and how much we've achieved, but more about how are you doing and how am I doing and more about that, yeah. Having better conversations, maybe. You mentioned earlier on um, imposter syndrome. Mm. I wondered if, because in the last couple of years, you've mm. been... Um, as well as doing some fantastic work, you've also had some really lovely um, validification for that work. You were um, um, the Evening Standards Rising Star in 2017 and BAFTA have taken you as part of their um, Elevate group. I wondered if, um, if those things help you feel uh, less like an imposter. I'm not sure I do question that because sometimes for sure it's got better, but I think it's also um, the practice of being able to reach out. I think I remember when I did bad education, I just, I shut down so much. I was so scared to get on set and I was so, I really struggled with, with imposter syndrome because I'd never done it before. Mm. Um, oh yeah. So Brene Brown, she talks about, um, the effing first time it's called FFT this whole idea of once you start re once you start recognizing that feeling as the effing first time you can kind of be okay with it it's like okay well I've never done this before and I've never met these people uh, this people before but I do know how to act and I, I, I do know how to do this and it's it's sort of practicing that isn't it and it, I guess every time you do it maybe it gets easier but yeah just recognizing that it's okay because you've never met these people before. And with what we do, it's every project, um, unless you're in a rep or, yeah. I think that's a really um, nice piece of advice to end on. Yeah. Um, and that, because that, that just, just about concludes series two of Chatterbox. Um, but look, before we wrap up, Kai, I wondered if you'd be kind enough to share mm -hmm. uh, your lockdown list with us. There's some things to keep us creatively stimulated in isolation. Okay, so, um, I have been, I have been watching and writing poems with Rupi Kaur. She does this um, hour-long workshops. That's it's all on her Instagram page. Oh and she wow! Guide you through um, her way, her kind of a couple of exercises, and you can write poems with her. And I've loved that, and I've been doing that every week. Um, yeah, and her videos are available online on Instagram and puzzles. Yes, <laughs> great. What kind of puzzles do you like? So my really good mate um, gave me a puzzle. It's a 900 puzzle, 900, 900 piece puzzle. I didn't think that I'll be into it. I'll be into it. It's very difficult, but it's very, very therapeutic. It's fun. It's fun That's to do. great. They're two really wonderful things. Just remind us of the name of the poet again. Um, Rupi Kaur. Rupi Kaur. Yeah. Excellent. She wrote Milk and Honey. That's her yeah. book, isn't it? Yeah. Excellent. Well, I, I will be going and checking out that um, poetry workshop myself. Now, look, that is all we've got time for today. If you've enjoyed today's episode and you want to catch up on any of our previous episodes, you can head over to playboxtheatre.com forward slash chatterbox. Yeah. And don't forget, we would love to hear what you think. So please do send us your thoughts, reactions, feedback to at playboxtheatre, hashtag chatterbox on whatever social media channels you like to use. And as this is our last episode, I must send out um, some special thank yous, one of which is to Rich Cooper, our technical genius, who has made the whole series run so smoothly. Um, I want to say thank you to M. Quash at Playbox Theatre, to Nicola as a party for her sensational marketing support, Chloe Nelkin PR, to Chris Van Kay for the video design work, and to Leo Clark for the music. Thank you, all of those people. Before we wrap up, just a quick reminder that Playbox Theatre the youth theatre who produced Chatterbox are in the middle of a £50,000 fundraising appeal that is absolutely critical to its survival. And they are just about at the halfway mark. So if you've enjoyed this episode and would like to support the company who make it, head over to justgiving.com forward slash Playbox Theatre. All that leaves me to do is say a final thank you to Kai Alexander for joining us today. Thank you, Kai. And thank you to all of our Chatterbox partners up and down the country. We really couldn't do it without you. And thank you to everyone at home for watching. Goodbye. Who knows when we'll meet again, but when we do. Bye, Kai. Stay creative and see you soon. Bye.